Hey everybody and welcome back or welcome if you are new. So it is spooky season and amidst spooky season I promised myself that since I had taken two months off I'm gonna compensate for that on October because this is pretty much a horror channel, okay? So in this vlog, I read some horror books. I read Bones and All by Camille DeAngelis, which is gonna be adapted to film, um, directed by Luca Guadagnino, starring Timothy Chalamet, Taylor Russell, Mark Rylance, Chloe Savini, and a bunch of other actors that I really, really love. Good stuff. And then I also read Endless Night by Richard Lehman, which is my first Richard Lehman book ever. I am a horror fan. And I have finally done things that I've had to do for a long time. I read The Shining by Stephen King, and I finally read a Richard Lehman book, okay? The Shining, I did a separate vlog, and Endless Night, I will tell you about over here. Cool. This is a weekly reading vlog, so it's not really themed, but it is also horror-themed. Okay, also this vlog went very well for me. Let's just say that I was very happy with certain books and I have a lot of thoughts on other books and you're gonna have to just keep watching to find out what those things are as people, okay? So with that being said, enjoy the vlog. Here you go. Hey everyone. All right, what is up? So today we are gonna be doing another vlog. I'm gonna be starting a vlog and I have no freaking idea what I'm gonna be reading in this vlog, okay? But I plan on reading a bunch in the next like three-ish days and I thought I would just document all that. Anyway, it's gonna be super conducive to this season we've found ourselves in. It's spooky season, probably one of the best times of the year, if not the best, okay? So I vowed to only read horror this month and so far it's been doing very well. I've been making very good on my vows. So much so that last night I was on Haley's sprints for Haley Ween and on those sprints I was with Haley, Taya, and Courtney. Amazing channels, check them out. Um, I started reading the book Bones and All by Camille DeAngelis and so far it's going pretty well for me. So the reason I picked this book up is because a movie is coming out and this movie is being directed by Luca Guadagnino the director of Call Me By Your Name and Suspiria, the Suspiria remake, which in my very correct opinion is the superior Suspiria film, okay? And that book is called Bones and All. So Luca Guadagnino is directing the film adaptation of Bones and All. And I didn't know what this book was about before going in, other than the fact that it is classified as like a YA horror thing. And I've never read YA horror, but the film adaptation seems to be R-rated. So so last night I started reading the book and it was so good. Like I am about over halfway through. Okay, so I'm gonna try and finish the book now. Sorry, I got distracted by the butterfly. I'm gonna try and finish, sorry, the, the plants are causing shadows. I'm gonna try and finish this book now, but I'm gonna tell you what it's about. So we follow this young girl named Marin and the book opens up with us meeting her and seeing that she is being babysat by this babysitter and one thing leads to another, and she ends up cannibalizing the babysitter, okay? And so her mom is like, dude, what the hell's going on? So the mom has to cover all of this up. She accuses this babysitter of being murdered by this satanic cult, and we keep following them on their lives, and we see that this cannibalistic urge of hers is something that she just cannot part ways with. Like, there was this scene where she was playing with this younger boy in a basement, obviously has a crush on her, and she eats him. We get to a scene where she is in summer camp, and this boy tries to do a sexual proposition to her one night when they are swimming by themselves, and she eats him. And all the while, the mom is getting extremely frustrated, saying, I can't keep covering up all these freaking murders for you dude so early in the book the mom essentially disowns her the mom is like i can't be with you anymore sorry you gotta go you gotta go find your dad i can't do this and the mom just up and leaves and leaves her all on her own so we basically follow her as she goes across the country trying to find herself and her dad and trying to make sense of the world and of her condition and her life and things and it's really good so far like i'm really enjoying it she does actually meet this other guy who is is a cannibal, this guy who only eats dead bodies. And yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far, so I'm gonna try to get a bit more reading in and then I will check in soon. Later that day. This book does read very YA. Like there isn't any gruesome gore, but there is no doubt that this is a 
cannibal story, okay? Now, the love interest doesn't come in until like the 40% mark, so either they fixed that in the movie or those of you Timmy fans are gonna be very disappointed because of how often he is shown in the trailer, so either he comes in earlier on or he comes in later. But so far, yes, it does read really YA, but I'm really loving how the story seems like a metaphor for the outcaster in society and his very found family. She's looking desperately for people who are like her. And the reason I do say this is because along their journey, she does find another cannibal. And then this other cannibal she finds is the Timothy character. And this romance sparks. It's one of those stories that I really love where people who are just so outcast by society find someone who is just like them not in every single sense but just enough for them to come to an understanding and finally be able to be who they are with someone and in addition to that like another really powerfully emotional thing over here is her reconciling with that familial abandonment that her mom imposed on her earlier on. But then can you blame her? But then maybe you kind of can. Despite the fact that it, it is from the point of view of characters who are obviously doing things that are bad, a lot of the emotion and insights in life do seem very universal and relatable to a lot of people in how this book does speak to the outsider in all of us. And it also does have some shades of a very feminist understanding of burgeoning female sexuality. That's another thing in this story. It isn't really plot heavy, it's very character driven, which I honestly do personally like. It very much is Marin's journey coming to terms with herself and coming to terms with who she is in relation to the world around her. I don't know, this book's making me think. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed. I am pretty obsessed so far. Later that day. All right, so I just finished the book and you know why I was so obsessed with this book. It's because it reminded me so much, so much, of the books Brother by Anya Alborn and True Crime by Samantha Kolesnik. The only thing that inhibited this book from being a perfect five-star read for me was the fact that it felt like those two books, but with less bite, okay? Like, those two books, despite the fact that they weren't gore-fests, did go further and dig deeper into the human psyche and present more disturbing scenes than the one that this book did. I mean, that's not to discredit the fact that this book does have disturbing scenes, it does, but it never really took me to that same place of darkness that those two other books did. All the violence in this book happens off-screen, but based on the trailer of the movie that I just watched, it seems to be a very R-rated movie, okay? So I think that there's gonna be gore, and I did read some reviews, one of which just said that you had to cover your eyes in some scenes, so I can only assume that the movie does go further in terms of the brutality. It is very much a fade to black kind of scenario as far as the gore goes in this book. Still, I had a really great time reading this book. It is a cannibal love story that's very understated, but pretty powerful. It's a story that um, speaks to the outsider and the outcast in all of us and does so through this meditation of the anxieties of its two protagonists, specifically Marin because she's the character that carries us throughout this whole journey. The Timothy character, um, he definitely does become a huge and significant part of her life, but it's genuinely her story that we are following throughout this entire thing. So these anxieties that this book probes are ones to do with growing up, fear of the future, feeling alienated slash rejected from family, stuff like that. And yeah, it does read like a coming of age YA story. Fans of YA might think this is too brutal, and fans of extreme horror might think this is too tame. I, on the other hand, just went in with an open mind and accepted it for what it was but I do think that there's gonna be a, a sort of disconnect with many other readers. And as a matter of fact, it only sits at 3.5 on Goodreads, which is generally considered to be quite low. And my suspicions tell me that that um, blurred line regarding genres is why this is a thing. It goes for YA, it goes for cannibal love story, but it never really fully commits to either one, you know what I mean? Despite its powerful message and everything it does well, it just stays in this um, safe zone that doesn't really push it to the limit, which is what I wish this book would have done, because otherwise I really did enjoy this book. Also, I would have liked to see what it felt like in the head of people when they were cannibalizing someone 
like in that moment because we really do just get to fade to black and see the aftermath. I feel like it would have been more psychologically incisive and more insightful had we been there and had this author really put us in the mind of these people even more. But other than that, I think this is a solid three and a half, four star read. I really enjoyed it and I cannot wait to check out the film. I think I'm gonna check out Night of the Prowler next because Haley recommended this book. It's John Athan, so this book didn't deliver the gore, but this one likely will. Also, I think I'm buddy reading this book with Jesse from Bowties and Books. I'm gonna have to check in with them and see when they plan on starting, because I think they're a bit busy. I think their mom is gonna visit them. Either way, um, I hope we have fun. Um, I don't know if they are an extreme horror fan, but I'm still really excited because every time someone reads a John Athan book for the first time, I just get all giddy because he's one of my favorite authors and his books are genuinely fucked up and gory and disgusting splatterfests. So Jesse's either gonna judge me or love it. Either way, I can't wait. So yeah, I'm gonna start the book now and check in soon. A few moments later. Okay, bitch, I just started Night of the Prowler and fuck, it is like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Okay, so, so we basically follow this woman named Zoe. She is working in this convenience store gas station. So she's by herself, she's scared. We open up the book learning that she, that she reluctantly accepted to take the night shift in this convenience store in the gas station that she works at and she needs this job, she needs the money and the night shift is what she is doing okay so while she's on the night shift she is getting paranoid and what i love about this book is it does show certain fears that are unique to women like you know strange men coming in at night into the store and you're the only woman there by yourself your manager isn't there anymore and what these people's intentions could be when they prolong conversations way longer than necessary and stuff like that. So yeah, right then and there, I am pretty hooked on the story. But wait, so we cut to this other POV and we learn that this man called the Prowler, that there was this breakout in this mental institution and this man called the Prowler had just escaped and he's someone who had killed his entire family, killed his wife, killed his kids, just snapped one day and his and he is currently going on this killing rampage throughout the town and it's being reported on the news there are people getting freaking murdered and she is just by herself in this gas station completely paranoid of the fact that the prowler could just show up and she is by herself she's defenseless she's a sitting duck she's all alone she's shit scared and i am shit scared for her okay so we're gonna continue reading update soon oh my gosh Two seconds later. So I got this book recommendation from Haley over at Haley Hughes. Love her. She's also an extreme horror fan. And she told me that there's like a scene with corn that traumatized her. And I got to the scene and I am also equally traumatized. Let me just say, I have to be very careful with these extreme horror vlogs because the last extreme horror vlog I did on the book Cows by Matthew Stokoa, a fictional book got demonetized from YouTube because apparently um, true crime YouTubers like Bailey Sarian, Bella Fiore, Eleanor Neal can literally describe crime scenes in graphic brutal detail and put crime scene photos on their screen and put cannibal in the title of their videos and they get promoted by the algorithm and not demonetized. Meanwhile, me discussing a fictional book gets me demonetized because that's the world we live in. We love platforms owned by giant billionaires who just hate small creators and won't let them get money, but the big creators get paid after they violate all the rules that I violated also. So anyway, I'm not gonna get into huge details into the gore of this book, um, but yeah, a cob of corn gets shoved in someone deep inside. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say about that scene, but so far it's been freaking intense. Okay, check in soon. Two seconds later. Okay, dude, this book is so freaking intense so far. I swear, like literally the other day I watched Halloween Ends, and if you've seen that movie, please comment down below what you, what you thought about it, because I want to take a survey. I want to know if I'm the only one that hated that movie with the fire of a thousand suns. Okay, the trailer, the promotional material made it look like an, an unending slasher splatterfest, best kills saved for the last movie. And no, it was a dumb romance movie with Laurie writing a stupid a memoir that honestly sounded really bad. 
Like, what she was writing in that memoir sounded so corny and so cheesy, and I was just like, that is Lori Strode, really? Did her dirty. Michael Myers, really? No, that was some random person in a mask. That was not the Michael Myers I know. That was some random person in a mask. Bunch of dumb shit. Okay, but either way, let me just move over here so I can tell you about some of the kills in this book. It's so freaking intense, like, I need to be very careful about what I say, but let me just say that there is some urethra trauma. Okay, there is a scene where someone's this gets stabbed and sliced, and then a hammer gets shoved in their hole, and they like it so much that they out of their bloody, mutilated I fucking love this book. This book is so good. I literally just want to go on Goodreads and give this book five stars now. This book is doing what needs to be done in the world, okay? It is literally giving me anxiety. It is so gory. It's so brutal. Shit's fucked up. We love that for us. The next day. All right, we have a, I have a lot to tell you about because the other day I finished Night of the Prowler and it was so good. And then when I was on sprints the other day, I started a new book. So I cannot wait to tell the vlog about this. Okay, so Night of the Prowler was so freaking amazing. I loved it. Loved it so much. So in my opinion, this is exactly what a... Sl so in my opinion, this is exactly what a slasher book should be. The other day, my friend Meg was complaining about this book called Camp Slaughter, I feel like, and she was posting on her stories about how slashers seem to be more conducive to the um, medium of film and that they don't work as well as books. And I do agree to some extent, like there have been some, there have been some slasher books that I read, namely Off Season by Jack Ketchum, which I just, did not care for. So much time was spent making us care about these characters. When they get killed off, we're supposed to care about them, but by then I just hated everyone and wanted everyone to die because I did not give a single rat's ass about anyone, and I was kind of angry that I had to spend so much time with them, which made the book so boring that I honestly was just cheering for them to be killed. That is not the case over here, okay? John Athan has this way of not wasting any time, like he throws you right into the story and keeps the intense momentum just going and going and going, like bam, bam, bam. All the while, he develops his characters throughout the story. He doesn't dedicate a huge chunk of time info dumping on who these people are. We learn about these characters as they navigate the horrible world he's put them in. And we learn about various decisions they make, various mistakes they make. We learn who they are based on what they do and based on how they reflect on what they do in the moment. We don't have huge swaths of story just info dumping on this person's past and what they believe and their creeds in life and who else in the book they've fucked before, like with Off Season. Yeah, I will always bash Off Season. That book is not as good as people say it is. It is just not good, okay? But Night of the Prowler, freaking amazing. It is a splatter fest, okay? The kills, every single kill is more gruesome than the last. I'm just absolutely obsessed. I am, I, I am obsessed. So then the other night, I also started this other extreme horror book and finished it on my sprints, and that is Degenerate by Rain Havoc. I didn't know what to expect going into this book, but being in the book was fucked up in a good way. I published this video on this book called Double Edged, which was this really weird incestuous romance story that romanticized twin cest and stepfather, underage, whatever, whatever. Really messed up book. And Judith messaged me saying, well, you haven't read Rain Havoc if that's messed up to you. And it's like, true, I'm intrigued, valid, but I feel like there's a huge difference between that subject matter in a romance book and that subject matter in a horror book. Like, the horror book seems to be more self-aware that the stuff happening is fucked up, whereas the romance book is, like, condoning everything, which is just, mm, I don't know, not the vibe. Not really the vibe for me. So she recommended this book called Degenerate, which is one of the few works of Rain Havoc that are on Amazon because I think her books get banned because they're pretty intense. And we follow this man who at the beginning of the book learns that his father was killed in a mugging. And so the father's lawyer calls him up saying, you need to come over to this house that you grew up in and I'm gonna tell you about how we're gonna move forward following your father's death. So he has this girlfriend and their relationship is on the rocks and we follow his journey as he journeys back to this childhood house and we learn 
along the journey that he has some very bad memories in that house that still traumatize him and haunt him to this day. And at the beginning of this book, I was under the impression that it was just smut, you know? I was like, what is this porno that I'm reading? It was literally just sex scenes one after the other. And I was like, am I reading an extreme horror? Like, what is this? I don't get it. I don't understand what makes this extreme horror. Bitch, let me just say this. It starts off pretty smutty, okay? Then when he gets to the house and that smuttiness takes a turn into the extreme horror side, my jaw on the floor. This story is so strikingly original. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a plot twist or a plot turn or a reveal like that in an extreme horror book. And I just love ways in which authors can make something smutty, go into something horrific and horrible just in the snap of a finger. Like, the fine line between smut and horror being crossed is just so fascinating to me. I think, um, according to Judith, the author is a woman, goes by she, her, and the protagonist is this, like, really shitty, misogynistic man. So this book reminded me a lot of the book Ritualistic Human Sacrifice by C.B. Hunt in how that book also followed this man who hates his wife and this book it's a man who hates his girlfriend and it starts off in a very sexual place and then ends up in an extreme horror place. I think Ritualistic Human Sacrifice is more intense as far as the extreme horror material goes but that doesn't reduce the places this book goes to, okay? Because it shocked me. It shocked me. I thought I'd seen everything that extreme horror had to offer me, and I was so wrong, okay? And I really love that I'm doing my best highlighting books like this on this channel. It helps me feel my best self, you know? It's seeing such original stories from voices who aren't um, promoted by the mainstream just gives me so much energy and motivates me to want to write my own books which I hope to do in the future one day. I hope to write my own extreme horror one day. I just feel so inspired reading books like this. And the day that I read this book, I also gave another extreme horror author a chance, a second chance, okay? Um, so I'm sure some of you are aware of what I think of the book Dead Inside by Chandler Morrison. For those of you who don't know, I did vlog my reading experience reading this book. And the other day, I posted this story on Instagram asking people to give me extreme horror recommendations. And they recommended the book Along the Path of Torment. Like, I got that book not a few times recommended to me. And I was like, am I gonna like this? Like, I didn't really care for Dead Inside, but I do believe in second chances. And although that specific story didn't work for me, the fact that this specific story is connecting with so many people who watch my videos, like my taste, and they're recommending it to me with confidence gives me some curiosity, okay? Two seconds later. So yeah, I read the book and it was good. It actually really surpassed my expectations. So I think I read in the author's note that Chandler Morrison lives in Los Angeles, he lives in LA, and that kind of shows in this book because this book takes a very harsh approach to life in LA, like the way he shows it as this vapid, disgusting, soul-sucking place and the way he comments on celebrity life and celebrity culture and the process in which people get famous. It's really interesting to me. It's very Mulholland Drive, Starry Eyes, but through the prism of an extreme horror book, okay? So let me just break down the basic premise for you. We open up from the perspective of our main character. He's this guy who is, I think, in his 20s, and he is an assistant to his uncle, who is this movie director, commercial director of sorts, and the book opens up with him auditioning people for this role, for this new commercial, and it's very sketchy, it's very casting couch-ish, you know what I mean? And in comes this underage girl who has to perform some favors to get the role. The opening scene is very shocking, but it gets more shocking in the sense that she gets the role and the uncle invites her to this party of sorts and they make her watch this video which shows the secret underbelly of the degeneracy in Hollywood, and that scene was like so fucked up. This book opens up with a quote by the Marquis de Sade, author of the 120 Days of Sodom, which is about these like four fascist libertines who kidnap these kids and subject them to sexual, scatological, and very bloody torture. So I was like, why is this book opening up with this random quote, girl? When I say that this book has all those things, specifically in the main character's backstory, it's a lot. There's a scene in the end 
involving three people doing the nasty that had my jaw on the freaking floor, okay? So despite all that, the only issue I had with this book was that the main character's internal monologue seemed like a very direct copy-paste from that of Dead Inside. Now, I don't want to accuse anyone of writing a self-insert. For all I know, Chandler Morrison is nothing like this guy, and he's just using this character's internal monologue to critique the world around him or present a sort of satirical approach like what American Psycho did. I never know what's in an author's heart, but I will say that this main character did work better in this world and did have much more commentary and insight. Like in Dead Inside, I thought that it was just very hollow and surface level and vapid and boring. But over here, seeing this character navigate this specific world in a story that critiques this specific culture, it worked so much better for me. So I think I'm gonna give this either three and a half or four stars. But either way, I really did enjoy um, Along the Path of Torment. I thought it was really good. And if you hate Chandler Morrison, I would recommend checking this book out because it just, it was good, okay? I mean, credit where credit is due, he wrote a very good book. Now, last night on Sprints, I started this other book that Judith recommended called Endless Night by Richard Lehman. This is a 500 page book, okay? And when I say that I freaking had anxiety for 200 straight pages, yes, I read 200 pages on Sprints last night. I have not finished the book yet, um, so I'm gonna try and finish that today and then give updates maybe tomorrow or throughout the day. But bitch, this book is intense, okay? The plot is sort of similar to Dean Koontz's intensity, but it takes a very different turn. And I do think I like Richard Lehman's writing better than Dean Koontz in how I can vividly see the movie playing in my head. It's not overly descriptive, but he chooses certain words and describes things and characters and scenarios in certain ways that really puts you in the moment, even though it's from a third person omniscient point of view. Like you really feel like you are in there with them going through what they're going through, feeling their heightened, adrenaline-filled state of mind. It was so intense. I felt like I was doing cardio reading this book, okay? So we start off um, meeting this girl named Jody. I think she's about 16 years old, and she's at a sleepover at her friend Evelyn's house. And one night, it feels very hot, it feels very clammy, and they're like, you know what, let's go turn on the air conditioner. So they walk outside the room and it's dark, the house is dark, and they hear a crash. They hear the glass shatter. As they're walking, Jody looks at Evelyn and she sees that there's a spear through her and the spear hits Jody. Someone literally speared Evelyn. So Jody runs off and she's like, everyone's getting killed. Evelyn's family is killed, everybody's dead. This whole group of people have just killed the whole family, but to Jody's surprise, Evelyn's young 12-year-old brother, Andy, is still alive. So she finds Andy, and as they're looking around the house, Jody gets this baseball bat, and she sees one of the perpetrators there, and she hits him over the head with a baseball bat. It's I love it when an author can write a female protagonist and give them agency and make them a truly active participant in their own story as opposed to a passive object that torture just happens to, but also keep it in the realm of realism. Like, okay, obviously a 16 year old girl isn't gonna be taking down a whole army of thugs trying to fuck up their shit, right? But she takes one down and I totally buy that. And they look down at him and see that he's naked and his ass is like sewn shut. And it turns out that these people, these criminals, are a group of people who target houses randomly and they wear the skins of their victims as clothes. So I was like, this is fucked up, this is unique, this is really shocking, I am into this. So we basically follow them trying to escape that house and we cut to the point of view of one of these killers who tells us that if he doesn't kill Jody and Andy, and he jeopardizes this group, that they're gonna kill his whole family and his family's family, okay? So it's literally just high stakes all around, super intense, super just like, bam, you know? It really throws you in the moment. I just can't believe this is my first Richard Lehman book. I'm super invested, I'm super into it. And yeah, um, I'm gonna check in soon. Probably when I finish the book, I'm gonna give you my full review. But yeah, gonna continue reading Endless Night, and I will chat soon. The next day. Okay, hello, oops. <laughs> hello vlog, last night I finished Endless Night by Richard Lehman, and come close, come, cl come really close, because I need to tell you some facts, 
okay? And the number one fact is that this book managed to put me in a state of, like, literal anxiety for 500 straight pages. Yes, a 500-page book. I finished it in two sittings across two days. This book was 500 pages of literal anxiety. It literally had everything I loved. It was disturbing, it was compelling, thrilling. So I read some reviews where people were criticizing him for not having the best writing style, and okay, he doesn't use tons of big words, he doesn't use flowery prose, but I would argue that he uses the right words. The right amount of words and the right words to convey certain things because I swear that opening scene was so pulse-poundingly intense that I felt like I was watching a movie. The way he describes something made me feel like the movie was playing in my head. Reading that book didn't feel like sitting down to read a book. Reading this book felt like sitting down in a theater lights out, full packed cinema, watching one of the most intense movies to come out in a long time. Like, I felt like the movie was playing in my head as I was reading this book. And the characters, they were just so real to me. Everything just felt so real to me. He does this thing that I really love in John Athan's books, where he keeps the villain and the protagonist away for the longest time, but manages to establish the antagonist as a sizable threat early on, and very much so during the course of the story. And it's just so effective. Like, I was kept in a state of suspense for the longest time possible. And this book was such a page turner, I swear. I was just like scroll and scroll and scroll. I was like, I could not stop. It lingered in my head long after it finished. The pacing was fast, it was exciting. Yes, it's very over the top, and yes, it does lean into some shock value. The main villain is this guy named Simon, who is part of this group of people that dress up in human skin and go to random houses with the fixed goal of killing everyone in the house and if they don't manage to kill everyone in the house the person who botched the mission for them is tasked with finishing the job and if they don't finish the job then the people in the group hunt down the person's entire family and their family's family and they just make that whole person's life their new target so if the person botches the job they have to kill themselves because if they get arrested and the police question them and they jeopardize the group's chances of going on more killing sprees then they are okay so you have Jody and Andy are amazing characters this 16 year old girl 12 year old boy who managed to escape and evade their killers that night and that POV is told from the third person so you don't really follow Jody in her head more so you're like this omniscient observer who can see into their thoughts and it just feels so effective and I truly love them so much. Excuse the airplane. And then you follow Simon, who is the killer, and it's a very unique first person point of view. We follow him on his various killings on the way to Jody and Andy, and he says this as like an unreliable narrator who's narrating the story into this tape recorder, and they find this tape recorder in the house of Jody, and so they're listening to the tape recorder, listening to his story, and he's like giving them enough information to establish himself as a threat, but then also not enough for them to not feel safe and to instill paranoia in their hearts. Do we really actually know what's going on, and can we trust what's on the tape recorder? It is just so freaking good, okay? This book has the pacing of a Hollywood blockbuster and the production of one also, that's how I saw it in my head, but it also has the daringness and grit and gore that only an independent movie would have. It's like a big budget, exciting, thrilling Hollywood movie that dares to go there. That's how this book reads. It's just so freaking good. Richard Lehman is delivering the pulse-pounding, continuous momentum tension for 500 pages. What the- I, I still can't get over it. Like, how did a 500 page manage to never be boring? Ever. I don't understand. I don't understand how Richard Lehman did it. I was just literally, the whole time, in a state of ridiculous anxiety. There's a scene where a character who presumably obviously has PTSD, this character is searching their house, and it's like a very beautiful full circle moment to the beginning when Jody and Evelyn were searching their house, and oh my gosh. So this scene in the end, when somebody is searching a house, the book gives you the illusion that they're safe, but because they're so traumatized because of past events, you literally feel every moment of paranoia that they have, like literally 
whenever they see that a curtain is slightly open or that the bathroom door is slightly open or that somebody left a light on in the other room and they're like, who left the light on? Where can I sleep? It's like, it was a long scene of somebody searching a house at the end and normally in scenes like this, I get really bored. But in this specific scene, man, I was freaked out, okay? Shitting bricks in this part. Yeah, this book was gory and intense as hell, and I gave it five stars, obviously. I love this book. Anyway, I don't know what I'm gonna read next, but when I find out, you will know.